All is possible. Are you a parent and you are advocating for your child to be included? And if so, I wonder what inclusion looks like today. What does it feel like today for your child? Or if you're a teacher or administrator, what does inclusion look like and feel like for every student in your classrooms? And if you're a student joining us today, welcome. And what does inclusion look like and feel like for you every day at school? Well, you are in for a treat because we have a powerful episode of the Art of Advocacy today. And I want you to join in the conversation. We have two incredibly guest speakers that will be joining us. So I welcome you to join with an open heart, an open mind, because all is possible. So we are going to start with a music interlude and we will be... And here we are through the magic of technology. We have Idaho, Ohio, New York represented today. So if you are here with us live, welcome. Let us know where you're joining from. And I am so thrilled that Dr. Julie Costin, Dr. Christy Predetti Franzak <laughs> are both with us today. We haven't seen you guys live on our show in so long. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I was just trying to put in the chat, all is possible. What an amazing way to start this episode. So thank you, Carmen. Well, welcome. And I am excited because not only are the two of you gonna be sharing some specific strategies that parents and educators can use to ensure that kids are in, in an inclusive placement, and we'll also have time for you to talk about the Summer Leadership Institute coming up. And we have some surprises for people along the way. So Julie and Christy, what would you like to share before you get started? Well, I would just like to share a warm welcome to everybody who's here. I can see people putting in the chat. It's great to see you all. And I want to second what Christy said around all is possible. Today is very focused on how families can achieve inclusion. And what we mean by that is whether you're a parent of a kindergartner or a high school student or anywhere in between, we're talking about how do you help a school system see what's possible and how do you help uh, a school system do what's legally expected around mm -hmm. inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you. And Christy, 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 uh, Sorry, give us me. some words of encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, sorry, I'm trying to look at it on Facebook and in here. Sorry, because I couldn't oh. chat here. Um, you know, Julie, I was thinking about um, our work the last couple of months on a court case with a family. And Charmaine, I was thinking about the title. I think maybe today is the art of advocacy. Mm -hmm. And then I went all the way back to my years as a home visitor in Oregon and thinking about mm -hmm. like, wow, this work around inclusion is still falling on the backs of families mm -hmm. and not by choice. So often in early intervention and just today, Julie, uh, our friend Susan Connor from Illinois said, Hey, I know you and Julie do stuff with school age, but would you be willing to meet with our early interventionists and talk about inclusion with yes. our infant toddler, you know, providers. And I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> and the first thing out of my mouth was they, you know, we have to help support families become advocates. And then the second part of me went, went, Oh, if that's a role they want to take on. Yeah. And I was like, dang it still, it's the mentality that we have to shore them up and teach them up and get them prepped up and ready to go battle versus you get to just be a mom or a dad or a grandma. Like yes. the privilege that I have of whether or not I want to advocate 
-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's inspiring, but it's what's on my heart today. <laughs> uh, people can say if they felt inspired by that, I feel sad about that, but it's yeah. so true, Christy. And I think what you're doing is just speaking the truth as where we are right now. And I wish we could, um, well, we've been doing a lot of work to change things in school systems and we're getting there and getting there and getting there. Yeah. And I think together with families, we're going to be stronger in the work. So there um, you go. Yeah. There you go, Sherman. There's the inspiration. Yes. Together yes. we're better. All okay. Right. All right. Little Michael Franti music and we're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so Julie, let's set the context for what we're going to share today. Um, a, a deep dive into one of five strategies and where this, this work started before you and I became a thing uh in terms of where the where we're going to talk about these strategies today so we just have a little historical context and then set up what we'll talk about today yeah the historical context is for the past 25 plus years christy and i have been uh on fire about helping families achieve inclusive education um there were several articles written a long time ago and there's a new article that you're going to look be able to see a pre-publication version See, Christy, I can't wait to give out surprises. So I know, I know. Uh -huh. so it's like, and we're just... probably a little previously <laughs> sharing it, but we we couldn't help it. We we knew we were going to be with Charmaine today, and we're like, we got to get this in the hands of of these uh, of her followers, who are some of the strongest advocates we know. That's right. That's right. So um, we recently wrote something that's going to be out and available very soon, but we're going to share it with um, the listeners of Charmaine's advocacy, the Art of Advocacy folks, and. Um, Everything we talk about is going to be in more detail in this article. So just know that you'll be able to get that today um, and we will be sharing all sorts of stuff. So let's just jump in. Uh, this is um, on fire. Yes, Lisa. Um, <laughs> this is five strategies to ensure an inclusive placement for your child. And what we'll do is we'll talk through each of the strategies, meaning we'll let you know what they are. And then we'll talk about the first one uh, at, at greater Deeply. depth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Charmaine, so, does that sound good? Yes, perfect. I love it. And look, there's that word possible. I know. <laughs> we didn't even plan that. So Anne, Anne Marie just asked, or, can we share the article yet? No. <laughs> Don't yeah. share it yet, but very soon you can. Um, like in a month, you can share it. So we'll give you, um, to get the article, you'll give us your email. And we'll give you the deets about how and when to share it. And then it will be free source for anyone. At yeah, all. it's a little bit wonky just in our timing. And you'll kind of know because in the article that you can get today for kind of your own advocacy and work, um, some of the links that we're going to talk about, you might see the website, but it won't be like live. And so that's kind of our last step is to work through uh, making all the I's dotted and T's crossed. So it's not, it's not like the, um, there's anyone like a guard or anybody that's going to come and check you if you share it. Um, yeah. but we'd rather you wait till it's like crystal clear and super easy. And then, um, uh, it's not our new book. Sorry. Can you see this also? There yeah. was that from Julie, but thanks yeah. for asking Kimberly. Good to hear from Iowa today. Um, our new book is out. I'll put a link to that as well. The book, Julie, why don't you just explain the difference between the book and the article and then we'll go back. Yeah. So the article is directly for parents about how to achieve inclusion. What are the strategies? What are the steps? What are the ways to think about it? What is the relevant litigation that we need to keep at the tip of our tongue and so that we can support these decisions? And how do you go about it in the best possible way when you're working with your school system to become inclusive? That's what the article is. <clears throat> the book is for administrators and it's, hey, administrators, here's exactly how to create inclusive schools. It's called The Way to Inclusion and we give seven milestones um, and we really, really support, I know, we really support the leader um, to help their schools become much more inclusive and get rid of the segregated settings and get rid of the 15 one-to-one -one settings and all those places that um, systemically we know can be very problematic for kids uh, and families. So um, th that's the difference. Okay, good. And Christy's putting links. I hope you're all looking because 
Christy's not only managing the PowerPoint and all those things, she's also putting <laughs> links in at the same time. And I know Charmaine will put everything in the show notes. Yeah, for time. sure. For yeah. sure. And I'm just kind of, as best I can, Julie, I'll keep up for now, but yeah. we'll dive into um, strategy number one from the article. And I guess I would say, Julie, um, and I'm sorry if I repeat you, cause I was looking for a it's link. Okay. You're fine. They, the article and the book are complementary. Like it's mm -hmm. the same message, the same, um, invitation, the same mm -hmm. dreams, just written for two different groups of doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really important. Uh, same messages, same ideas, same values, same vision from different perspectives because a family's role in this process is different than a school administrator's role. Okay. Yeah. So the first strategy is to learn what's possible. And what we mean by that is learn the ins and outs of inclusion and segregation, be ready mm -hmm. with stats and data at the tip of your tongue so that you can explain exactly why you want your child in an inclusive placement. Okay. Okay. Sorry. One more sidebar, Julie. And yeah. you might want to stop sharing again, uh, Charmaine. Julie was just on the principal center radio, yeah. radio, uh -huh. principals center radio. And the reason I'm bringing this up and I'll put a link to the podcast in the chat right now. Um, the host of the show, I feel Julie, I said this yesterday, I don't know if you agreed with it, but I felt like the host that interviewed you really played kind of the devil's advocate or played the naysayer or played the yeah, but person or, and really from a, from an IP meeting perspective, something that somebody would say, like your kid's not safe or is going to hurt our other kids. So we can't, or we don't have a paraprofessional that can support your kid. There were several of them. And I, I mm -hmm. think that it was so powerful because Julie took each one of them and laid down what you could say. And so I feel like that was a masterclass in how to keep my calm and how to rebuke the yeah buts. But that that was my take of it. Oh, that's really kind, Christy. It's a good, it's a quick uh, listen. So Christy's going to put that, that's called the Principal Center Radio's interview. We did it, it just came out this week. Um, but it's exactly that. It's sort of how do you address in real time concerns that people have about inclusion? So we're going to get you all, all set. Um, the, oh, good. Kimberly said, what was the podcaster show again? It's called principal center radio. Oh, and Christy just put it in. Yep. And Kimberly, I'm replying just to you and I'll give you the link as well. We'll have a blog ready for it in a couple of days with a transcript. So if anybody wants to read it, we'll have a, a transcript and you can always have it uh, translated into other languages, but right now it's audio only on their podcast. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. okay. Now I really am ready to go yeah. into number one. Like Julie said, when you said the myths, that's what made me think of it. Okay, here we go. Where we always begin. Yeah. Where we always begin. Christy and I believe so strongly in this definition that I'm going to quickly read the first two paragraphs. So if you're listening, you can just relax and uh, know that we will share this with you if you're interested. But our definition of inclusive education is this. Inclusive education means we no longer accept that separate classrooms, separate schools, and separate lives are in the best interest of any student. Separating people by ability disadvantages everyone. Belonging is a human need. Our educational system, practices, and spaces need to be reimagined. Inclusive education means every student is valued because of their strengths, gifts, and even challenges as disability is simply diversity. Everyone benefits from meaningful participation and opportunities to learn grade level content with diverse peers. We must trust that all students come to us as incredible whole people who do not need to be fixed. Okay, so this is where we start. And uh, we start here almost every time we work with school systems to say, hey, this is what we're talking about. But it's not just these two paragraphs. It's all of the ingredients needed. And today we're not going to talk about these ingredients, but we want you to know that it's more than um, just where is this child being educated. It involves differentiation. It involves support right <coughs> where kids need it. It involves utilizing challenging behavior as the opportunity to create warm and safe relationships. 
it involves many, many parts and pieces. And some of these parts and pieces, families just need to know, be aware of. And it's really the job of the school system to create. Okay. And I think, you know, Julie, uh, from a family's perspective or an advocate's perspective, because you might be a self-advocate, you mm -hmm. might be a teacher who feels pretty alone in a system uh, that's trying to advocate, understanding that people, um, that, that all of those ingredients will impact the success a student or family experiences can be somewhat overwhelming, but it can also be reassuring to say, okay, we've tried this and this, but there are nine parts here. Have we, have we influenced, mm -hmm. have we fixed, have we addressed all nine of them? Not that they are all of equal weight, equal uh, impact or equal effort, but it might help you understand where you got stuck or why a district said, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. Mm. Mm, great idea, Christy. So use this as a way to look at the fullness of what inclusive education is, mm, especially when people are saying it can't happen. We don't do it here. They do it in the schools next door, but not here. Any of that nonsense to say, OK, so this is what we need to do to bring it here with us. And so besides understanding what's possible and what's necessary to make inclusion happen, we have to understand that there are some big myths around segregation. Mm. And what I mean when we say myths are these are things that are told to families that really aren't true when we study more closely. So, Christy, do you want to go over the myths that yeah. we find? Yeah. And Julie, I'll say it's not only that we sell this to families or tell this to families. Yeah. I think just the lay person on the street would say this kind of makes sense mm. that if you... Okay are segregated and we would probably say small group or we would say specialized or we would say highly trained, right? We would, we may not say, oh, I'm gonna send your kid to a segregated. We'd say a special school or yeah. a customized or personalized, right? So we usually say, hey, you know what? If you go over here, could be in the hallway and it could be an hour away from your home. Yeah. Um, we can give you more direct instruction with people that are highly qualified. They know exactly what to do for people like you, whoever you are. Um, it won't be so distracting. You won't have all of these um, other things that your kid has to worry about or navigate. It will be very individualized and um, they will be able to achieve probably, it'll start with IEP goals, but it might even be like, you know, they'll learn all the content you've ever dreamed they could learn. I don't know, Charmaine, have you ever been told that bill of goods before? Oh, yes, 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 yes. And like you said, it, I mean, it sounds like, well, who wouldn't want well, this for their child? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, exact, exact comments I hear every day. <laughs> all right. So they, don't get us wrong, friends. These are myths. And even the other day, a friend of mine was telling me about an experience with a friend that she knew and their grandchild and that the child was finally in a segregated space and thriving. And it was a hard conversation because it's not that I don't want that kid to thrive. Rather, I want that kid to thrive. I want every kid to thrive. My argument is that the magic, what helps kids thrive, it's not a mystery, Hanjali. We know what it is. And we're going to talk about five of them today. We just mm -hmm. have to be willing and able to do those things. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are the myths. And people kind of buy into them because they seem logical, Julie, or we've been told it, or we've seen it with our own two eyes, maybe. Yeah. What, what's real? Yeah. So um, the real facts about segregated classrooms, our students spend less time on academic instruction, students are taught more frequently by paraprofessionals or special educators who don't have uh, expertise in the in the content oh, area. Students experience higher levels of distraction. People say it's a non-distractable environment, but if you've ever been in a self-contained classroom, that's simply not true. And students receive actually less individualization than they can or do in general education settings and students have less access to grade level content. And so those facts counter the myths that we often believe are true. And it's really important that when they're said to you that you know the research doesn't support what people are saying. 
Okay, so that's the first thing is we just kind of get our mindset around that we're going to have to debunk some myths and people yeah. are going to hold on to these for a lot of different reasons. And then we go, but what can work in the general ed classroom? Maybe, Julie, if I were to bold to say, if you want better instruction, if you want reduced uh, behavioral distractions, if you want progress to the general curriculum, hey, we actually know what to do. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And someone asked, uh, can you share where the data is from? The oh. That data is from an article that I wrote. Yep, two of them. And in the article, Julie, that they're getting the full citations and more are there, if that helps your brain. It helps my brain if it's okay. Pro we promise they'll be right in the article for you, okay? Yeah, um, I'll put the link one more time to how to get our article for today's um, Time with Charmaine. Uh, and that article will have the reference that you see on your screen now, the Barnett and the Costin articles, and uh, a few more that talk about the facts and the myths. So all, everything Julie and I are talking about today is unpacked in our five strategies article that you can download immediately. Okay. Okay, so go. definitely having learning what's possible means understanding what's inclusive education, deeply understanding the myths that we're told, and deeply understanding that there are powerful inclusive classroom practices that need to be bolstered so that educators can be successful. Okay, so these are collaboration and co-teaching so that educators work together instead of in silos, special ed and general ed. Things have to be differentiated, meaning we're going to think of the range of learners and we're going to support all of them all of the time. Adaptations when necessary, natural supports when necessary, and really careful, thoughtful behavioral supports so that all of our students can be successful together. These are the ingredients that we're calling the powerful inclusive classroom practices. They also are very detailed in the book that we just wrote. I don't have a copy. Of oh, that. that's fine. I'll do both for you, Julie. So in the leadership book throughout <laughs> ASCD, there's one whole chapter devoted to these five practices. And in the article that you can get for free today, we describe each of them with additional references for each. That's right. That's right. Okay. Oh, uh, our favorite way, which is our least favorite way, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, Christy? What's well, we always like to be possible about a positive about what's possible. But we love this question because it gets to the heart of the problem. Yeah. So we've been saying this to school systems. You know, you're not an inclusive school system if. And we're just taking co-teaching here. Just co-teaching, yeah. Co-teaching looks like one teacher on this, a sage on the stage. Oh, actually, Julie, sorry, the five practices is what oh, we're Oh, they're doing all now. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Co-teaching yeah. co mostly looks like sage on the stage and a floating support. Lessons are designed with a one-size-fits-all approach. The range of learners is not anticipated, meaning educators aren't expecting mm -hmm. a range or they're surprised by a range. Or instead they're bemoaning of, the range. Or they're bemoaning the range. And... The top strategy for students with significant support needs is to get another paraprofessional. And outdated behavioral support strategies are being used like timeouts and planned ignoring. Okay, these are telltale ways to know that the school system isn't as inclusive as they might think they are or as they might say they are. Um, because they're not using those practices. Yeah, so there's the five practices and you'll know you're not using them if this sounds awfully familiar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's go through each of the five. We're going to go pretty quickly, friends, because Julie and I could spend eight days on each, and we are going to spend three days on these at mm -hmm. our Summer Leadership Institute. So we want enough time to highlight them, get the article in your hands and all the resources, and invite you to come, uh, and your district, of course, to come to SLI in August to go deeper. Yeah. So we're giving this uh, a five minute discussion and it's going to be a three day discussion um, for your school district. So that's the SLI that's coming up. And I don't know um, how and if we're going to be putting together some like raffles or something like that. But if you're interested in the SLI, you can put that in the chat. Um, some of you I already know have been there many times and you can let people know if you've been and what it was like. Uh, and if your district has come to the SLI also. Okay. Yep. 
And um, so, Julie, I'm going to tell people that I'm going to put a link to SLI that's got Charmaine's name in it. So, you know, you're in the right place. Yes. Um, if you want to come uh, by yourself with your team or with your district, by the end of our time together um, today, we'll show you how to do each of those things. Everybody can save 25 percent uh, because you're Charmaine's friends. <laughs> and then I think we should give a giveaway uh, Charmaine, you tell us how you want to do that. So, um, yeah, what we could do is we could wait um, until like the end of the weekend. So people sure. who watch the replay have a chance to also be included in the, in the giveaway. So what we do is the more comments you make, the more entries you get. <laughs> so right. keep your comments, questions coming. It helps us be interactive with you, and it also will gain you an entry into the giveaways. And if you don't want to say something specific, can you just put pick me in the chat? Is that okay? <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Great. Okay. And good. if I watch it later, I can still say pick me. <laughs> yes, yes. You can still make okay. comments at, at when you're watching the replay. Okay. okay. Hi, Cheryl. Right, we got the rules. Thanks. We got the game rules now, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Okay, good. So um, we were talking about co-teaching. And I guess, Christy, why don't you go to the next slide? I think okay, sure. Sure. Um, I got you. Even more important to say this. Really effective co-teaching does several things. It reduces student-to-teacher ratio. It provides more access points and it increases novelty and fun. So if you look at the research on good co-teaching, good co-teaching does those three things. And so we're really, really helping um, school systems do their best co-teaching by using this little formula, one plus two plus three equals Sorry. effective co-teaching. That's great, Christy, go ahead. I was ahead. trying to read your mind. <laughs> you did, you did, you read okay, it. Okay. Yeah. And so, Christy, explain these six co-teaching models and why and how we've divided them. Yeah. So if you want to do those three things, I'll just show you real quick again. You want to think about ratio. You want to think about access points and you want neurons to fire together. Code word fun. Then we use different co-teaching models and these come by different names and they may look different if you're early childhood versus if you're in high school. But the ideas behind them um, are quite similar. And so the three at the top are the most effective or they're more effective at doing those three things. The mm -hmm. other three models are less effective. It doesn't mean less effective, like don't do them, but we just wanna not make those be our default or what's easy or done the majority of the time because we can get so much more out of station teaching, one teach, one make multi-sensory and parallel, meaning I can reduce the teacher-student ratio I can increase access points and we can have more fun, which makes teaching more effective and outcomes stronger. So again, in the article that you can download today, you will hear a little bit more about this as well as we have a section of resources that can bolster co-teaching uh, in your district. Okay, so we're going kind of fast. Was that too fast, Julie, or is this okay? I think it's perfect. perfect. Okay. Um, the second powerful inclusive practice is differentiation. And you all know, uh, folks that are here, you know and understand probably that we've got to get really creative in education. We have to do several things. We have to expect the range of learners. When we say range, we mean academic range. We mean social range. We mean cognitive range. We mean communicative range, behavioral range. Every single range, we should expect a range of human beings to attend any school system. And when we anticipate that range and plan for the range, we are ahead of the game. It takes less effort. And then everyone benefits when we plan lessons that have the range in mind. Now, let me be clear. We do not mean just ability group, low, medium, high. We don't mean that. No, we've that's really old-fashioned thinking around... Um, education from the 70s and 80s. And now we know, no, 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 the, the, our job isn't to separate, segregate, sort by ability. Our job is to bring all kids together and to build in the supports right when and where they need it. So that's kind of what differentiation means uh, to us. 
Yes. And I would and say once again, Julie, in the podcast you did for the um, uh, Principal Center mm -hmm. radio, you answered this question because the host asks you, well, what are the benefits and who benefits and why do they benefit? And so I think if you would like something right away and something that is free, uh, check out Julie's podcast because she answers this very question about mm -hmm. um, the range anticipating and the benefits for whom. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. Okay. And so Christy, do you want to do three, four and five, or do you want to move to the big five from the article? Uh, just talk, you mean to show the five? Yeah. That's what I was kind of thinking. Sure. Let me see if I can do that with some amount of grace. Okay. They're all squished together. Somewhere. And then if you want to come back to the, <clears throat> these, we can unpack. Okay. Yeah. So just to be clear, everybody, the reason I said that is we've got five strategies to include, to ensure inclusive placements for your children. And the first is learn what's possible. And we took a bit of a deep dive right there just to say, Hey friends, you have to know the five powerful classroom practices, which are different than the strategies. Um, you have to know and understand what inclusive education means and why we're moving away from segregation. Okay. So that's kind of it in the article that you can get. We also outline all of the important legal cases lately, all the way from Andrew to Brown versus board of education and everything you need to know and understand that's moved inclusive education forward. And then we also put a lot of the research articles that will help you um, to sort of make your points, to uh, be really clear about what you mean and what you don't mean about what you want for your children. And I think this one's important because, um, you know, you are expected at some level to become like little junior attorneys. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times people will throw around, well, the law says, or the law, or mm -hmm. we don't, you know, and you'll be like, oh, I don't know. I didn't read it that carefully. So mm -hmm. I feel like this is a good primer where uh, people who've been doing advocacy for decades, lawyers that we've worked with, uh, Julie and I have testified in cases, kind of brought that collective uh, evidence as a starting place. It's not exhaustive of all disability rights, uh, but it does highlight the key ones that pertain to LRE, least restrictive environment, uh, and pertain to education uh, decision making. I feel, Julie, the closest. Absolutely. So the strategy is the first one is know what's possible. The second is know the legal facts. So today we're not going to get into them, but just know they're there collaborate effectively on the IEP. And so we give a lot of strategies and Charmaine is kind of a guru right. in this particular area, but how to make decisions about what to prioritize and how to approach a school system and how do you collaborate most effectively so that you can get the outcome that you're really desiring for your child. Um, so this is a strategy three. And if you want more than strategy three, then just hang out more with Charmaine and, and read everything that she's written because it's kind of the um, truncated version of that. And I would say, Julie, as a preview plug, um, yeah. Shelly Moore, who I know mm -hmm. is a fan of yours and vice versa, um, at SLI this year, she will be uh, doing a workshop that will be talking about inclusive IEP writing. So if people want to bolster that particular skill set, because Julie, we often hear the IEP says, and then it becomes this golden rule and the IEP is either wrong, bad, <laughs> uh, something. And so how, but then people don't know how to change it because this is how they were trained or this is how the district has approved it through their software. Yeah. Right. And that goes right into strategy number four, right, Christy? Yep. Um, know your rights when the school remains resistant. And so we often say that there is a time um, to really, really decide that you're going to draw your line in the sand and it is around placement um, just because of the legal rights of kids, just because of all the research that shows how much better it is for kids. And then just because of what we all know and understand to be true just by being humans, that belonging is an essential component to growing up and uh, experiencing life. So what to do if the school team remains resistant? What are your rights? What can you or should you do? Um, and then the- And Julie, maybe I'll just share what the article looks like on that. Would that be helpful? That'd be great. That'd be okay. Great. Can you see that? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So just because that one might be exciting to people and that you can get this article today um, 
just I'll put the link again in the in the chat. Um, we're just not giving out to the entire world, which is kind of funny because we're on Facebook, but you know what I mean, uh, until it's like completely done. But Julie, I'll go slowly and you can tell me to pause if there's something you want to highlight. Yeah. So we just give a lot of very specific ways to um, deal with and support when your school system is resistant. Um, and then we talk about disagreement strategies. And so a lot of you have unfortunately had to deal with mediation and due process and all that stuff, but we provide you with support around that. And then the fifth strategy, Christy, this is a nice way to do it actually, okay, is I'll just show the right article. Here. Yeah, is just build a network of support, how to build a network of support. And we recognize that not all people are able to build a network of support, but what we want you to do is know what support networks exist and how to pull in uh, different supports so that you yourself um, are able to keep your own oxygen on while you go through these significant trials of getting your child included. And I well, wish yeah. we didn't have to talk about this, but we recognize just how intense it is to do this work. Well, and I appreciate you saying, Julie, that, um, you know, not everyone has the resources, whether that be human, financial, mm -hmm. emotional, time, whatever variable. And so what we really tried to do was um, not put more pressure on families to be like, well, then your kid's going to perish because you have to work three jobs and don't have time to restructure education in your school district. Well, right. sorry. So we really tried to say, hey, friend, there are a lot of things out there that you can use. And so I'm going to scooch down here, Julie, to say beyond the references, Mm -hmm. There are lots of things like videos that you might share or do a quick learn about. There are books that you can get from your library. There are websites that are open source and free or geared specifically for families. And I know this is like one more annotated bibliography, but we tried to put sort of the most recent things and things that are related to this idea of placement. So it's not everything you ever needed to know about disability, but really things geared around placement decisions. So if that helps, um, it kind of goes on and on. But, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 So number one, if you're watching this, um, just, just want to say welcome and thank you for coming and for knowing Charmaine and knowing the important work <laughs> she's doing. Second, you probably want the article so you can go get it, check it out, read it underline it, star it. Don't quite share it yet, but you'll get to share it real soon. And then uh, the third thing we wanted to make sure you knew and understood, um, besides the five strategies that we mentioned in the article that are, I think, so helpful, is that you don't have to do this alone. We're absolutely here with you to support school systems to become more inclusive. So one of the things we found to be some of the most effective ways to get your school system to change is to introduce your school system to us and let us do the heavy lifting around how to train school systems to become more inclusive. That's okay. All right, so just uh, if you don't mind, that's our, our best way is to say, hey, school system, do you know inclusive schooling? This is what we're about and what we're interested in um, creating through our Summer Leadership Institute. So Christy, is it okay if we take a step over that way? Yeah, is it not sharing there? It's perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Um, and in a minute, friends, we'll uh, talk a bit or we'll reference a letter that you can adapt and write as an email or as a script to talk to your district. And that's part of what you'll get in your email this afternoon. So if at any time when you request the article, you will also get a link to uh, the letter that we'll talk about to help you help others learn about SLI. But first, we're just going to start about what is it and how does it support advocates in doing those five strategies that are covered in the article? Okay, Julie, I'm ready. Okay. Well, Charmaine, how many years have you come to SLI, would you say? Um, I, I think it, when it started being virtual, because I never yeah. was actually in Syracuse. So yeah, yeah. this will be your fourth year. Yeah, yes. so fourth year. So we've been virtual for four straight years. And what this allows is no matter where you're listening from, your school system can come to SLI virtually. Okay. It is a three day event. It is all about how do you take your school system from where it is right now to become much, much more inclusive. 
using those five practices that we kind of shared quickly. Um, and it's inspiring, it's motivating, it's exciting, and it is full of strategies that people can take and use immediately, whether you're family members or it's really, really geared towards school administrators because our hope is that we help to change school systems so that we don't have to have these conversations year after year at an IEP about where your child belongs. But the answer to can my child be included is, of course, absolutely. And how can we best support your child? Those are the kinds of conversations we dream that you have at IEP meetings. And one of the ways that we create this is for is by helping school systems become inclusive. Yeah. Um, and Brenda, great question about like, do we talk about community housing or mm -hmm. uh, specific stages of one's life? Um, and so I would say that SLI is both generic and specific. So mm -hmm. generic meaning we speak about inclusion and you can take those practices and principles and apply them, whether you're a three-year-old or a 30-year-old. Sometimes we are specific and we might have a on-demand recording, a panel, or a full-blown session on a particular topic. Um, and so sometimes those topics emerge from times like this where a lot of people keep asking the same question or something that Julie and I see in the field. So um, I don't think this year we have something specific to that, but you would have the opportunity to network with others in states, families that have worked towards that. Um, so your network gets bigger of people who've gone before you or her going alongside you that you can partner with. So I don't know if that was your question really, but it's just a, a good question about how specific do we get, Julie? Um, yeah. But you can keep going. Yeah, so uh, why don't we just share um, who's coming so that you know okay. who's coming to the SLI this year. So we, uh, Christy and I do the majority of the big sessions and we also invite, you know, our dear friends. So Shelly Moore has already been mentioned. Christy and I are both uh, listed there. Um, Sean Ginwright, if you haven't heard of Sean Ginwright before, um, it's a whole new way of thinking about inclusivity related to race that has been very powerful, that includes a brilliant uh, step called take a look in the mirror first. Um, mm -hmm. And then Bettina Love. And on this one, we don't also have, um, Jordan Zimmerman, who's coming, and Christy, who am I missing? Uh, the Mod Squad. Yes. <laughs> Otto Lana and the Mod Squad. Yeah, we've got a lot of folks coming. Um, then we have a bunch of on-demand stuff that I couldn't rattle off the top of my head right now, but you've got the main ones, the main sessions. That's right, yeah. So it's not just the two of us, um, but what we do is we help school systems move from point A to point B, and we support them through it. Um, so it looks like lots of folks, I know, Lisa says Dr. Love is fabulous too. I just would like also Dr. Love and uh, we should have given her a full like. Um, yeah, and she has a new book out and you might win it. And Kimberly, we appreciate your persistence. Kimberly's like, I have been trying for three years to get my district to come. Maybe this is the year. We can we can keep trying and keep hoping and, and find different things that would be the end for them. Yeah. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd absolutely love to. So Christy, why don't you share about the letter just so people know what okay. this letter is? Because okay. it's kind of an easy, now easy, right, Kimberly? It's an it's a, a way <laughs> to share um, with folks from your district exactly what SLI is and how they might come to it. So Christy wanted you to know this is editable, meaning if it's not exactly the way you talk, change it. But it gives all the basics about what is the SLI and how can we attend. Um, um, let me put that in the chat again. Um, and, and the letter just sort of does uh, what Julie said, like the basics, so you don't have to worry about um, what, the, what the incentive would be. That said, if it's ever helpful for your district level decision makers to get together with Julie and me, we also have a thing called an AMA calendar. It's an ask me anything and they can sign up or you can sign up um, and invite them. Uh, and for 15 minutes, sometimes it goes much longer. We can talk about what are your needs? What are, what are your unique attributes because maybe there in Iowa, um, there's something about your configuration or your budgets that Julie and I can work around. We just need to know what the barrier is for them. So don't hesitate to 
um, make use of that. Ask me anything about SLI to see if we can come up with a regional quote, a small district quote, a um, large district quote, anything that might make it possible uh, that we don't believe in a one size fits all. We market a one size because it's just easier. And then we go, you know, if we need to talk, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so that's the letter, Julie. Um, maybe. I think here's what like I'm thinking. I'm this? just looking okay. at the. Oh, go ahead. Kristen. You go ahead. Oh, I was thinking this. Uh, speaking of ask me anything, I just want to make sure that people have an opportunity because Christy and I don't often come on Facebook Live. Um, if people have questions about okay. how do I make my school more inclusive? Uh, how do I, you know, any kind of specific question. And some of you, I know that you're living a long narrative, a longer story that's too big for this kind of back and forth quick. But if you have any specific questions that we could get to today, like what's your number one strategy or how might you, how might yeah. we best, we can do that. We can also answer your questions about SLI, but I just want to make sure if you came today and you were like, I'm really trying to figure out how to approach my school system. We've got a lot of supports for you, um, but we're happy to answer those questions. Yeah, maybe, sure. I mean, you, you can help if no one has one right away, but we'll give them time. But if there's one that we missed in the chat or one that you get often or one that you were hoping we would talk on, we can go anywhere. And I can well, these know, resources. The one point I wanted to piggyback on that both of you have talked about today is, you know, typically it has a lot of the advocacy and change has been on the back of parents for yeah. decades. And what I love about the work that Julie and Christy do is it is at that systems change level that they're working at the most. And that allows every parent, every student to have their voice heard when that system change is happening. And one of the things that I've done away with is this badge of I'm that parent. Mm -hmm. And I used to feel like that made me special and important because I was out on the forefront advocating for my son, Dylan. And what I realized by talking with others is we have to we have to take away that badge because what that does is that um, puts barriers between us as white privileged middle class parents and all the other parents in the system that don't have the time, that don't have the energy, that for whatever reason can't be at every IEP meeting speaking up with authority. So thank you, Christy and Julie, for looking at the system needs to change. Mm -hmm. And then it's not up to individual parents to be on the forefront fighting. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And so this is why it's a little bit hard to talk to families is because Christy and I stay at a systems level, right? So we don't do very many individual family uh, things anymore because we see our role or our calling or our business to be most effective when we're doing whole school change processes, meaning helping leaders understand why inclusion is the way, what's the dream, et cetera. And so our number one strategy for helping you get there is to introduce your school system to us and let us take it from there because that's all we do all day long. Uh, I was just, Charmaine said something about, you know, how's your May going? And I was like, it's great. We're barely training, you know, right now because it's May. And Christy's like, we're doing about three to five presentations a week, uh, but that's a lot more than our usual, you know, well, nine. Yeah, a lot less, nine, yeah. Or sorry, a lot less. So anyway, that's all we do is we support school systems to make these changes. Um, and that's what we love. And Kimberly Van Beek says, uh, replacing that parent with the power of yet or until mm -hmm. now is a mindset change. I too used to use, um, I'll just say, I mean, I used to use shame as a way to get school systems to make changes. And I would say, you know, look at this data. If you're not there, you know, that kind of stuff. And what I realized is there are humans behind the change and every human needs to be treated in a different way. And uh, actually since working with Christy, we have a, a very different way of approaching school systems that is 
quite humanistic to say, hey, here's where you are today and here's where you can be tomorrow and we'll support you to get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Christy put our systems change path. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, and Julie, be thinking about, I have the Circle Makers as an ebook if you want to do something fun. Yeah, yeah. I anyway, think about it a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, so speaking of systems, uh, it might be like, what does that look like? What would you actually be working with them on? And so that systems change path includes seven milestones from our ASCD book um, that you'll hear some overlap between what we talked about today, but also yeah. about what Charmaine was um, speaking to, which is, uh, the inequities of our educational system from funding to uh, teacher prep to uh, restraint and seclusion. All of those are impacted by things like race, ability, language, socioeconomic status, and even uh, political affiliation and religion and things like this, all of our identities. So Julie and I work with school systems to really think about what are um, the bigger pictures, the bigger places where we're marginalizing, uh, sorting, separating, um, and doing harm to our students. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, hi, Michelle, you're here too, good. Um, good, Michelle's answering a question that came up earlier, which is, talking about uh, friendship support. And so a question is, you know, how do you promote friendship support? How do you think about friendships uh, at the level? And so we're going to start systematically, system-wide and go all the way down to strategy-wide. So it starts with putting kids with and without disabilities together and giving them common tasks to do together and giving them collaborative tasks to do together. So it's not enough to be sitting next to a kid or with or partnered with, it's got to be an interactive experience and it's got to be over time. So friendships happen over time. Uh, as you all know, um, you don't often like meet someone and then you're expected to be a friend and it, and it works out like that happens over time. And it happens when we create inclusive, warm environments where kids can be themselves. It happens when we use humanistic behavioral support strategies. So nothing that's like a chart that shows just how naughty this kid is or this kid is because that we know undoes friendships. It's also about paraprofessional support and not having kids Velcroed to an adult human all the way down to very specific support strategies and friendship building like circle of friends. Charmaine, do you have favorites that, um, Dylan used or that uh, other people can, yeah, Michelle says finding commonalities. Um, well, you know, and one of the things that Dylan's teachers were great about, especially in elementary school, were class meetings yeah. and not specifically talking in, in our case about Dylan, but just all the kids. Like, you know, what does helping look like? What does too much helping look like? And, yeah. you know, those kinds of conversations. So when a teacher can pull in all the kids and have class meetings, I think that's a very helpful strategy. Mm -hmm. I think um, I want to build on what you said, uh, Charmaine, and what Angela commented about. Do you see Angela's about yeah. how her mm -hmm. daughter? So what we have to remember is that all humans are human and our preferences change mm -hmm. with time. And so I might have in preschool been comfortable with a class wide meeting, but now I'm in eighth grade and I don't want anybody talking about my reading level or my vision or my hygiene or whatever might be my issue. I might want to have some um, small group time with a close friend or with a trusted adult and or I want to make sure that those class-wide meetings, it's up to anybody, anybody has a class wide meeting, not just the kids that are struggling. Does that make sense? Like, and I know you weren't inferring that, but I'm just, it made me when I heard the two, I was like, we might find a strategy that works in preschool that no longer works in third grade or no longer works in high school because as humans, our preferences change or the pandemic, I believe, changed many of our temperaments. And so, right. like, if we were a homebody to begin with, now we're totally a homebody. We're like, that that was good like being on shutdown I, I like that for those of us with privilege i'm sure but for some of us that anxiety went clear down 
For others, the anxiety went clear up. So I think it's just that sort of like have a whole toolbox and always involve the family and the student because my mom's perception of me is not the same as my own perception of me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, ramble. Let me just ask you this. We're not going to do it, but I want you to do everybody who can hear us zero to five. How okay. excited zero is not excited. Five not is thrilled. Okay. Imagine right now, if we said you're going to go into a small group setting with the people that are here, three people at a time, and you're going to share what you've learned today. Okay. Like random people that I may random not know from people Wisconsin that you're not going to know. And they might be from any state. Um, just put zero to five really quickly. How excited would you be for that mm -hmm. task? Um, so I can just take a look at how excited people are. Charmaine, what's your oh, 5,000? Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, that's so good. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> Cheryl says four. Okay. Angela's a two. What else do we have? I was kind of a zero. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Charmaine. I like those. <laughs> okay, good. So they vary. So we've got Angela here, right? And Angela's like, I'm a two. Good for you for saying it. I'm probably honestly a zero uh, because I don't love forced communication. It makes me really right. stressed. And so we just have to remember that human beings, all human beings, have similar excitement levels about every single task we ask people to do together. And so, yeah, Michelle goes, wait, if I could pick my people. So Michelle's yeah, like, or if I didn't have to turn my camera on or things like that. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. And Kimberly's like, I'm currently on a field trip. So that would be hard. Yeah. <laughs> For that's sure. right. And so just knowing that um, we've got to be really honor the fact that there's also a range of interest in social interaction. And it's okay that there's a range of interest in social interaction. Okay. Yeah. And I guess, Julie, I always take that on to like, I might be more social when the activity is. Um, um, lower stakes like today i had my first golf lesson and huh. it was i had a lot of anxiety about it and i i'm a performative student like i want to get it fast and do well and i'm a little bit competitive so it's better not to put me in a group setting like that because i'll struggle but if it were something i was really um flew it at and felt comfortable, I would love it because then I can be like the support for the new person because I know how they feel. So it's, it's just interesting how different we are with mm -hmm. different configurations. So I can only imagine for you parents that are trying to figure out what my kid needs at English language arts versus out on the recess versus after school activities, because those are three different humans. That's I think. Right. That's right. And we have such a single brush that we paint with for people like not interested in. And yes. I'm just noticing Michelle's like saying we're talking about or Lisa says my preferred topic inclusion. Right. Uh, so some of you are like, yes, I would love to talk with a small group of people about inclusion. No problem. But what if I was like, it's about Real Housewives of Orange County. Oh, or, <laughs> Christy's like, no, thank you. I'm like, I'm in. Right. Or like Christy always wants to talk about baseball with me. No, thank you. I don't understand it. I don't even like beer. There's nothing about it that excites me. And so it's just, we've got to remember that we as humans have a variety of interests and it is okay that your child doesn't want to talk about non-preferred things because guess what? Neither does anyone here. That's right. Thank you, Julie. Neither does anyone here. And if I see one more IEP that the kid acts out because of non-preferred or unpreferred activities, I'm going to give that kid a gold star every time. <laughs> Good for you, kid, for knowing what you like. Yeah. Hold, yes. on, hold on to hold that. Hold on to that. Hold on. And I know it's not fun and it makes you like rejected by your teacher, but I'm serious, friends. That's what you need in this world. Why does everything have to be unpreferred? I don't right. know. That's a oh, exactly. Thing. And, and why do you start teaching a student to work longer with, with, with a yes. non-preferred yes. activity instead yes. of let's have him work longer on something he likes? Because that's you know? perseverating, Charmaine. If you stay with it too long, <laughs> then you're self-stimming. It's not enough. And you have ADHD. It's like you can't win. Right. Yeah. And well... I want to thank both of you for being here and thank everybody that has been with us live and the people that will be joining on the replay. Um, 
the links are here posted several times so people can come back and click on those. I'll also be putting those in the show notes that I send out um, next week. And I just really encourage families to have a conversation with their school district about the opportunity that exists when the district um, invests and prioritizes uh, the inclusion of all students. And to me, it's we're not just looking at students who have IEPs, although that is a focus a lot, but it's, it's every student, right? We know there are other marginalized students in our system. So having a conversation with your district is going to be really important. Being able to use the letter that Christy and, and Julie have drafted, and like you, you know, Julie has said, you can tweak. But really, even if you've been shot down before when you've asked for, you know, teachers to have professional development, go back and be brave and have that conversation again. Um, because we do have to be operating at how do we make change at that systems level. That's going to ensure that all of our kids are protected and um, included. So, Julie and Christy, thank you, thank you, thank you. I so appreciate your time and um, and just your dedication to making schools in our communities a better place. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wish we were out of a job. Wish we were out of a job, Shani. <laughs> Someday. I know. We're on it. We're on it. But thank you for all your followers and what they do every day, not only for their own families and for their own self-advocacy, but what it does for everyone that comes alongside and after you. So thank you. And we didn't talk about any giveaways. What do oh. you think? Because we wanted to give away oh. some, some yes, prizes. I, um, who knew? Who I, knew? I have some new swag that I would love for somebody to get. It's <laughs> A mug that says now. up until now. <laughs> and it also says the power Not of yet. 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 Oh, so nice. um, that'll be one of our giveaways, Julie. And well, you know, this isn't a giveaway, but I did want to share <laughs> that Julie is a renowned artist. And and I speak with and, and that's not funny or sarcastic. <laughs> I uh, and I was looking at this today and what it says across here is release. And um, there are many days when this painting has been a great reminder for me. So um, I'm not going to give the painting away. <laughs> Julie and Kristen, do you want to add a giveaway? <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, and let's give away everything. You can have anything on my desk. But well, like, what's on my desk? I have some protein shake. <laughs> so you don't want what's on Christie's no. desk. I'm okay. Um, but here's what we'll do. We uh, have we can give everybody who attended um, the book that you mentioned, Christy, the Circle Makers book for free. Oh. So everybody who wants it, it's a downloadable. So you can take it, use it, share it. It's the PBS. Um, it's the PBS uh, video turned into a book. Um, so if you don't know about the PBS videos, those are also, we can put in there and you can use them, share them, et cetera. But you can have your own Circle Makers book as a gift. And then we're happy to give away a single seat, Charmaine, to any of one of your viewers. Okay. So, um, so um, make sure that if you've been with us that you say, pick me or, Hey, I'm here or something, because I think Charmaine does a uh, eyes closed selection. Um, do you want to pick what day or time you're going to do that? So I think what we'll do is have it open until, um, how about if well, Mother's Day is Sunday? How about if we say until Saturday at five o'clock Eastern time is when we'll have the drawing and, um, so come back, encourage friends to come back and make comments and questions, encourage mm -hmm. each other. And Saturday at five o'clock Eastern time, you will see who is the lucky winner of 
the best prize in the world, right? An individual <laughs> seat at Summer Leadership Institute this August. And for those who want to change their mindsets, we'll also be giving away probably more than one of these because we want to spread the news that up until now, it's been a challenge to have our kids included. And guess what? That has started changing already. So thank you. Thank you. And I get to go to an IEP meeting next. So the reality oh. of advocacy is always here, right? <laughs> yeah. We send you all of our yes. magic. I'll accept it. I'll accept okay. it. Send it. <laughs> and send so, it to all of you, too, who are here. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yes. And we will, I'm sure, have another occasion when we all get together and um, just go out there and believe and know that all is possible. So until next time, take care. And we love you all. And we applaud all the work that you're doing and wish the best for your kiddos. Right?